good evening everybody uh, welcome to another edition of epidemic watch talk series today we have dr santosh rakachakopal who is a public health professional who is going to talk to us uh, today evening uh, dr santosh studied in uh, government medical college thrissur and later specialized in child health from the institute of maternal and child health at calicut and further uh, acquired postgraduate qualifications from the royal college of pediatrics and child health in the uk university of sydney uh, and is also a european board certified uh, professional in pediatrics he has worked in various hospitals across the across the country and across uh, the world um, previously he had worked in uh, medical college thrissur at the institute of medical sciences in cochin he had a brief stint uh, in maldives before he joined back as a uh, health professional under the who uh, thank you uh, dr rajkopal for joining in here uh, the floor is all yours okay uh, good evening and uh, many thanks for everyone who has joined us on this uh, pleasant uh, cloudy sunday evening where i am sitting in calicut so without much uh, ado and thanks for that uh, introduction dr vinod and i'll just start sharing my screen and we'll start okay so um, this is rather longish presentation but uh, i will try to make it uh, brief um i'll just let me uh, talk about the context and uh, of this presentation and a little bit of uh, background so and this was uh, the idea came to me because one of these meetings which we constantly conduct on polio pulse polio days that we give sensitization to doctors and ngos and everybody there was this claim in one of those states which i worked that uh, the pulse polio started there and uh, they had actually implemented it first and that pulse polio was actually a brain child of uh, that particular uh, uh, epidemic uh, epidemiologist crowd uh also i happened to interact with the rotary a lot because they are important partners and uh, i was once asked to talk about rotary's role in polio so th this presentation was a, uh, of a com combined effect of both those uh, incidents so i just wanted to know how come when did we start this mass polio vaccination remember this presentation is about mass polio vaccination or what you like to call as pulse polio in 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 india and in kerala we call it the intensified pulse polio immunization in india but where did it start and it's basically history and maybe a little bit of story too so these are the major references um, uh, which are there and this huge list of uh, documents which i went through and most interesting were the records of the house of representatives of the united states congress which is freely available online 1960s and some of them are other other papers which are there at that part of the uh, uh, part of the part of the century and of course a lot of photographs from the www dot our world wide web so let a little bit briefly on uh, the modern history of polio so it is somebody called badam who described an acute paralysis suggestive of poliomyelitis in four children 1835 even though we can see in the egyptian clay tablet uh it is mentioned it is recorded as a child having a paralyzed limb the modern history probably starts in 1835 and in 1840 uh, hain published a monograph where it was uh, recognized and defined as spinal paralysis and duchenne very very familiar for his duchenne muscular dystrophy and charcot charcot made it to this everybody is familiar with those so they located the atrophy in the anterior horn cells of the spinal gray matter and this was the origin of the term poliomyelitis so this is 1855 and 1875 uh, herb introduced again another famous neurologist who goes who goes by the initials of, of the disease which he described herb palsy so he introduced the term acute anterior poliomyelitis and medin first reported the epidemic form of the disease in 1890 so even the people knew that it is polio it is anterior poliomyelitis nobody knew it was an epidemic or nobody described it as an epidemic till 1890 this was in uh, summer of 1887 in stockholm there were 44 cases I'll just uh, briefly uh, go through this slide so uh, 1905 was the first time somebody recognized that poliomyelitis was an infectious disease so till then people did know or rather did not understand it was an infectious disease and lansner and popper demonstrated in 1909 that the etiological agent was a filtrable virus Uh, and again uh, it was very early that we found out that 1931 that there were three types of poliovirus 
type 1 2 and 3 uh, and this was of course named uh, after brunhild lansing and leon now the concept of poliomyelitis is an enteric infection so it was an epidemic uh, it was an infectious epidemic but how would it infect other people so the first uh, stirrings of uh, it being an enteric infection was in 1932 uh, when Paul and Trask found the virus in feces and recovered the virus over a period of weeks from patients and healthy contacts. And of course, now we have people saying that it is a respiratory uh, spread and all that. Fact is that it has been known that it is an enteric spread plus a little bit of pharyngeal spread, mainly in the developed community. So in tropical countries like India, it is, the spread has been recognized to be fecal oral. So uh, what was this polio all about? Now, we are all now very familiar with the panic surrounding the pandemic of COVID. This is just a newspaper uh, photograph from the 1950s, which says all schools in the city closed and there is a ban on all children. So children should stay indoors because they are all in danger of getting the virus somehow and also giving other people the virus. So there's a ban on all children coming to public places. So this is the kind of panic that was there in the United States. This is the 1950s, a little about a little before 1950s. And of course, the most famous polio victim in US was President Frank, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now he was um, very interesting that later on, sometime in the last uh, couple of, maybe last 10 years, people have argued that what Roosevelt had was GBS and not, not polio. But then at least till today, he's still considered as the most famous, one of the most famous polio victims. Uh, you can see in the wheelchair and during his presidential campaign, uh, Roosevelt was never seen in a wheelchair. So he was carried backstage. He used to rise himself up onto the podium, hold onto the podium and speak so that nobody recognized that he was actually using a wheelchair. And even though it was a little bit known that he was having some problem uh, in walking because of the polio attack he had. So again, one of his assistants was Basil O'Connor, who was very famous for organizing what is known as the March of Time. So this is much before the vaccine. So National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. Now, this was Roosevelt and Basil O'Connor's founding in 1927. Now, what was this March of Dimes? It just exhorted all people in the United States to donate one dime, one dollar, to the uh, to the government so that they can find a cure for polio and also take care of polio stricken children. Why it was called March of Times? This was a contemporary radio program called March of Time, which was actually coined by stage screen and radio star Eddie Cantor. So they changed March of Time to March of Times. And in fact, uh, Eddie Cantor also inspired a nationwide fundraising campaign in the week preceding President Roosevelt's birthday on January 30, 1938. And it's, it, was, it was said that White House was swamped with money and uh, all, uh, all the coins and letters written to the president. It was actually a silver tide which swam the White House. From 1938 to 1955, when the vaccine was launched, John A. Salk vaccine, not the Osiban vaccine, the foundation spent a uh, whopping $233 million on polio patient care alone. Now, this is some of the advertisements which came out during that time, joined the March of Time, survival is not enough, and the same, same photograph which we saw earlier of Basil O'Connor, who was the president's secretary. And this is the very famous, or let's say infamous photograph, which, uh, uh, which has been uh, circulated uh, throughout the world probably. And this is the iron lung or the negative pressure ventilator, which was used for polio stricken children whose respiratory system had failed, whose respiratory was in respiratory failure and paralysis. So they were put into these iron lungs. Only you can see only the heads are showing out and the lungs was used to be expanded by negative pressure. Now, this is a polio ward in the United States in the 19, late 40s and 50s. And of course, we are now uh, uh, very familiar with how the press treated the arrival of the, the first vaccine for COVID when there were headlines throughout the world that the Pfizer vaccine and the subsequently the COVID shield, which came on say the, the Oxford vaccine. Now, this was the first probably, uh, this is again similar to what happened during the polio uh, vaccine discovery because Jonas Salk is seen here, Salk's vaccine works. And this is a um, newspaper which announces that particular news. And this of course is our hero. That's this Albert Sabin. 
and sabin who was he he spent 30 years in cincinnati children's hospital and in fact during the war he was doing some research for the development during the war on encephalitis and fly fever dengue fever because those were the uh, diseases which the army faced the armed forces faced during world war 2 following the war he returned to his work with polio and human trials for the sabin oral polio vaccine were held in 1957 it was licensed in 1962 of course much later i mean much uh, after the licensing of the sock vaccine now as we saw o'connor and the march of dimes were predominantly promoting the sock vaccine the sabin there's a very interesting side story about how sabin and sock were at little bit of blogger heads because sabin believed in publishing uh, in proper journals and packing foot forward sock little bit a little more populist and the popular press was very fond of john assault so all these things have happened so science scientific community at that time apparently accepted sabin more than sock we had he had gone through all the rigors of scientific publication um again a uh, very important thing that we have to remember is it is not just the united states but soviet union at that time now it is russia which had made important contribution and the person who was behind that was mikhail shumakov and mikhail shumakov is a familiar his surname is very familiar because all three of his children became virologists and today are associated with the uh, russian sputnik vaccine also a lot of interviews with them and press statements given by the, his children during the, the launch of the russian coronavirus vaccine so mikhail shumakov so the success led to trials in the united states as well as licensing of sabin vaccine in 1962 even though uh, the master of dimes opposed it politically as well as scientifically so eventually of course in course of time sox vaccine was replaced by sabin's vaccine the huge part of the of the world at least during the early phases of the eradication drive now this is very interesting that this is sabin's own words that when he was developing the vaccine and uh, in the early 50s when he was trying to license it uh, tom rivers was the chief scientific advisor to the national foundation for infant and paralysis which is providing all the funds for uh, sabin studies he said you are not going to be successful with this vaccine because already sox vaccine is there and this is a live virus vaccine please discard the entire opv into a suitable sever this is sabin's own words now uh, enter shumakov so in 1956 sabin met mikhail shumakov a russian scientist sabin provided his trains as well and sabin was very generous and this that he has never held on to his his patent or anything he has always uh, uh, believed in the greater good of humanity so he provided the trains and uh, to the uh, to the russian uh, to the soviet at that time soviet scientists and uh, mikhail shumakov began to produce it for use in his country and the first time in 1959 few million children in estonia and lithuania received the vaccine it was a success story a lot of the uh, results were very good and it contributed to the development for the commercialization of license of these strains in russia or in soviet union who was he mikhail shumakov he had uh, discovered the etiology of uh, tick-borne encephalitis and during this he was accidentally infected with the virus and developed encephalitis which led to permanent loss of hearing and paralysis in the right arm so he was one of those people who actually got affected by the virus he was studying in studying uh, among other viruses he studied are the oms hemorrhagic fever the camaro fever virus and the crimean congo hemorrhagic fever all of these names are familiar with us now so he had worked with all these viruses and just to uh, uh, to highlight the fact that even albert sabin had mentioned that is the soviet uh, uh, the trials which led to the uh, probably the more popularity of the of the sabin uh, sabin vaccine so this is from the extracts from the us congress records archives available freely online so in he says 1959 then the decision was made in the soviet union so the largest trials were carried out in that country that oral vaccine should be given to entire population under 21 years of age this is the first time 1959 that we see this usage of mass vaccination up to 21 years of age so that was the original proposal and again uh, it is said in 1959 in view of the harmlessness and immunological this is again from the congressional records in view of the harmlessness and immunological effectiveness of the live vaccine ussr ministry has given permission for a considerable expansion in the volume of vaccination so from being in one country one part of the soviet union to latvia belarus and moldavia all of them are part of the uh, soviet union at that point of time 1.5 million children were uh, given vaccine the oral polio vaccine and of course 
the results of this uh, mass vaccination was presented in the first international congress on the live polio virus vaccine in 1959 so they say that this is i'm not going to read this but basically this was the report uh, in terms of its efficacy in preventing so mass vaccination with live virus vaccine uh, it just you can just see the huge number of people 6.2 million people were vaccinated there was no accident no adverse event it went on all safe and smooth and this is reported to the international conference so it is very difficult sometimes to find find out who was the messiha of mass vaccination was it sabin was it shomako so it is very well mentioned in this particular publication that mikhail shomako in 1958 59 makes a statement that mass and simultaneous immunization with live polio virus vaccine throughout a district city or region so as to ensure the maximum coverage by immunization within the shortest possible time to minimize possibility of long term circulation of any polio virus strains among the susceptible population now this is of course the basis of mass polio vaccination that is simultaneous vaccination shortest possible time now why i put this slide up is because it has been very prescient so he says that why should we do it in the shortest possible time is to avoid long term circulation and return to neurovirulence now we are today seeing in the world that a lot of the vaccines which we use some of them have actually become vaccine derived polio virus vdpv so this was predicted even at that point of time so that is why he was saying shortest possible time now this is where he we start we see the initial stirrings of what we can call mass vaccination and for subsequently an attempt at eradication but the problem was this was cold war going on and why should the united states of america go behind soviet style so the the, the doubt raised in the who by uh, countries like us was that can we believe in the safety and effectiveness of a vaccine because this has been manufactured and distributed predominantly in a dictatorship in a free country like usa how feasible is mass vaccination by voluntary effort so even though this data was presented people are skeptical because it is coming from a dictatorship from behind the iron curtain so dorothy hostman um, she was a consultant to the who she was asked by the who to visit the soviet union czechoslovakia and poland to find out how exactly it is being done what are the quality of vaccination what are the quality of their laboratory diagnosis of polio virus all these things was uh, interested dr the hostman so this is his her report sabin lai polio virus again this is called vaccination trials so imagine today giving a vaccination quote on quote trial to 6.5 million people it is unthinkable but this was 1950s it was still called the soviet sab so the sabin label polio polio virus vaccination trial now just look at this paragraph and you will see that our pulse polio is very similar to what happens even today so preliminary propaganda campaign before the vaccination program dr shomako sometimes himself goes with one or more of his staff members he addresses the doctors of the area and this is what we do before the pulse polio we assemble we assemble the doctors and speak to them about pulse polio explain the program the role of the physician the responsibilities during vaccination and close surveillance so being having worked in polio surveillance for 15 years the importance of surveillance cannot be overstated at the same time there are radio and television broadcasts by shomako explain to the people the necessity for their full cooperation this is a typical pulse polio program you can see that this was probably our own programs model probably unconsciously or consciously after the soviet efforts again surveillance this is what we do right now today itself so as so what they did was there's the niche area teams responsible for vaccination but also doing surveillance so each home was visited every 5 to 6 days in order to check on possible cases now the pediatrician sees the child makes a diagnosis and if epidemiologist visits the home of the child then there is a history chart and of course there is a lab confirmation and dr horstman actually gave a very good report to the who regarding the uh, lab facility as well as the campaign in russia in soviet union now what happens in the us so following the success of the soviet program uh, dr sabin now in, uh, unleashes the mass vaccination in april 1916 in cincinnati where he worked this is probably the first mass vaccination in a western city 76000 people were the target they ended up vaccinating 181000 people given the of course at that time three vaccines were given in in subsequent like type 1 was given uh, type 2 was given subsequently type 3 was given after that it was not a polyvalent vaccine we have 73% coverage for preschool children and 79% for school children in cincinnati this is of course the advertisement which preceded 
the the vaccine drive you can see the hospital and clinic hours for free sabin vaccine this was done on sundays it was done over a period of time it was not done on a single day as we do in pulse polio today the cincinnati study was uh, a landmark because it preempted many issues that subsequently defined the program like spread of opb to non vaccinated children priming of by the ipb of a opb response importance of virological study and the operational challenges in a free society including india so this was all sort of in in, in trial run in the cincinnati study let us look at this again this is from the document submitted to the united states congress so the zero conversion rate was almost 100% for all three types this was studied so the dosages and schedule are there again the effect of opv in ipv primed children so a lot of them are already given being given ipv you can see that the opv here the zero conversion jumps this is before opv and this is after opv so even with ipv primed children opv created a big jump in the in the in the antibody so this again this is something which we have been using uh because it is already mentioned in many of the ipv programs that ipv prime children getting opv first they are uh, safe from vaccine associated paralytic polio second is the immune response is much higher when you give opv uh, after ipv now what about this unvaccinated contact now this is very very popular that you know when you give opv to a community even the unvaccinated contacts get the vaccination protection is it true or not we have a lot of data which uh, currently available uh, but the initial data did not promise much because you can see that unvaccinated children only 0.7% developed uh, antibodies and this is only in the lower socio economic status upper socio economic status was zero obviously because they were following strict sanitary rules and they were not having open defecation in countries like india probably it is much probably higher i have done little bit of data analysis uh, some time back uh, about uh, the spread of opv not uh, not antibody studies and it is it is a modest spread only so we do have children who uh, grow whose stool samples show oral polio vaccine without being vaccinated themselves because we record dates of vaccination in all children with paralysis but the number is very modest Now, this is of course the dramatic fall in polio cases following introduction of ipv and of course ip opv came in some time later so already united states was seeing a huge drop in the polio cases following the sock vaccination of course sabin sundays now we call them polio sundays so this were time when hundreds of millions of children were given opv doses again you have to remember that again at this point of time it is still not a single day vaccination like in india and of course rotary international when i was initially asked to talk to about rotary international i was always thinking that rotary has at best played a little bit of supportive role in the polio vaccination drive but uh, when i actually went through history rotary's role in polio eradication has been substantial now sabin in 1960 wanted the who to lead the global efforts against polio by because he was giving the vaccine free of cost so he was he wanted the manufacturers to distribute it free to all developing countries so that we can eradicate polio but uh, see he licensed it freely to manufacturers in 1972 he then donated his trace to who and what happened so and another thing which happened in the between in between was that there was this cuban connect this again is a direct extract from a first hand uh, account so this is john sieber md who was the vice chair of the rotary international polio plus committee john sieber actually was having a, a breakfast in the hotel he was staying where he was attending the conference in miami in 1960s so both of them joined as all of us you we attend conferences no you know we we at we joined we talk over the breakfast so what was uh, sab been saying about opv and cuba he said in cuba instead of you know storing the vaccine in the clinics and then giving it over a period of several sundays because they don't have too many fridges or refrigerators to show store the vaccine they were actually taking the health authorities or taking them to entire country and a matter of few days vaccinating the entire country so and then coming back and do it again next year so instead of relying on multiple clinics they would take them like just as we do in pulse polio and uh, give it in their doorstep so instead of rely uh, uh, relying on clinics we are relying on a community distribution of the vaccine so this again is probably the next step in pulse polio vaccination that we which we see today and the results were spectacular by vaccinating all children simultaneously cuba has not only protected each vaccinated child 
but has eliminated polio so this was a conversation between john siver who was uh, who, who was a, a combination he was a rotarian he was rotary's international uh, polio plus committee chairman but also he was chief of infectious diseases at the national institute of neurological disorders nindis so this was a very fortuitous combination of uh, a, a, a physician being a rotarian working to the advantage of uh, the world now again uh, this is not the last slide so it does not look like was a eureka moment when scientists suddenly decided okay mass vaccination is good nid national immunized pulse polio is the way to go but the first campaigns were in ussr 1959 the cold war even though it was a cold war period the vaccine as well as the seed strain was a gift from usa to so to to to, uh, to the soviets sabin was prompted to do this because back home due to popularity of the salt vaccine government was not too keen on opv soviet era scientists presented a paper in june 1959 in mass vaccination so this is very very really old actually the technique of mass vaccination is not really new it has been there since 1959 and sabin himself tried in the western countries in 1960 and this is cuba 1962 you can see this the child children are being immunized in the field in in their houses not in the clinics now this gentleman is important because he was a brazilian president uh, brazil had a, had a series of uh, military presidents military rulers and general joao figueiredo i hope i'm getting the pronunciation right so this was the first non communist country to hold a nationwide immunization day that is why this is important so nationwide single immunization day in a non communist country was in brazil and this was uh, from uh, from 2330 cases per year it came down to 122 even though the military leader he did, did a lot of good stuff like this but why brazil of all the countries why should sabin choose brazil now here in lies a tale now, his wife heloisa sabin was a brazilian by origin it apparently the brazilian government used this connection to take advice from sabin regarding the control of polio and of course later on heloisa sabin became a steward of his legacy he was a, she was a tireless activist in fact she died very recently 6 years back she spent majority of her time speaking and fundraising continuing her husband's work in immunization so by quirk of history because she was brazilian probably brazil became the first non communist country to implement a quote on quote pulse polio now the sabin the brazilian story itself is very interesting because he went to brazil he went to the states he recommended a state government while deriding the national government it's like somebody from us coming to kerala and say oh kerala is doing a good job but indian government is not doing a good job nobody would go and be like that and therefore the brazilian uh, national government was upset but they still continued with the program uh, and again the other person finally when the program is being launched for eradication so still now only mass vaccination is happening nobody is dreaming of eradication now who dreamt of eradication so klemranov dr international president in 78 79 he was in Phil- from philippines so he had this uh, uh, idea that we can being an island of course that we can eradicate uh, polio from philippines or eliminate uh, polio from the philippines so in 1979 at the rotary convention in rome when jim bomar was incoming president of rotary international uh sergio announced that protarians of rome was ready to help the children of philippines the philippines had the intention but not the money so the protarians of rome therefore decided to donate 500000 doses so he was a world war 2 pilot chartered accountant he was from australia he wondered whether uh, you know the lot of programs undertaken by rotary so he had read a story and this is very interesting he reads some he reads a magazine story about eradication of smallpox he thinks why can't rotary do the same with polio and of course he had another he had a friend again similar name i mean very familiar name john siver who was you again a rotarian and also as i said chief of infectious diseases at the nis so again so siver also happened to be friends with john sark and albert sabin and that is how the whole coalition came about and therefore in 1979 Rotary International Government of Philippines launched a five-year effort to immunize six million children against polio, and this actually kick-started the global effort to eradicate polio. Even though at this point, even at this point of time, WHO was not very keen on accepting the eradication flag. So, you know, 1982, immunizing all the world's children against polio by the time of 100th anniversary of Rotary International became an official Rotary goal. And 1984, Rotary's incoming president Carlos Kinesco appointed John Seaver to lead the polio 2005. So this was 2005 was the goal of eradication. Of course, we know that it is overshot by more than a decade. Now there was a problem still because WHO was not interested because after smallpox, WHO had taken up malaria eradication. 
all sorts of things which failed. So Ciro de Cuadros was chief of the immunization division of the Pan American uh, Health Organization. He was not. Um, I was still debating whether we should have an eradication goal or we should stop short of that. So Sabin again said, no, no, we have to eradicate. So he had a detailed plan for a three-person task force, a volunteer vaccination armies could be used. He said, you can also use it for other services like vitamin A supplementation, oral rehydration, anti-helminthic treatment. Now, all these things he said we can deliver along with OPV. In fact, we did a lot of this stuff in Africa. We were distributing mosquito nets in, uh, in Africa along with polio vaccines. The Rotary accepted the proposal in 1984 and aimed to raise $120 million. This is, of course, Dr. Sabin and Rotary president announcing the polio 2005 plan at the press conference. But of course, WHO was still not on board. So WHO leaders said that, look, this is going to be impractical. Why not we use the system we have, strengthen the system, and then probably uh, pursue national immunization days, not exclusively, but along with as a, as a strategy, one of the strategies, not as a single strategy. Now, finally, what happened was that even though the person behind this whole idea was uh, Sabin, the Rotary's leadership uh, actually then accepted the WHO's uh, model of pulse polio being one of the approaches and therefore started to sideline Sabin again. So Sabin therefore resigned as Rotary's advisor in June 1985 because the Rotary was now more aligned with WHO's model of multiple interventions that of course included surveillance, routine vaccination, and pulse polio or national immunization days rather than the single strategy alone. Of course, this is uh, one of the photographs. This is from the early uh, period of uh, the Rotary International's efforts. So finally, Rotary moved closer to WHO's view that this is national days for one tactic among many. And of course, Rotary moved its role to activities more consistent with their identity, you know, as fundraisers, as advocates with governments, advocates with religious leaders, advocates with people, rather than being an organization saddled with implementing the program. That should be the government's role. So Rotary's involvement in every country was critical in maintaining political commitment at the highest levels of government. This is Sirio Dikadro's statement. And of course, money. $247 million by 1980, and now it has run into millions and millions of dollars by this time. It's still continuing. So they had a target of 120, there is $247 million. And of course, in 1985, the PAHOS director unveiled finally a campaign to eliminate polio in America by 1990. This is almost six years after Rotary declared its intention. So this was a combination of all the ideas of Sabin plus smallpox lessons plus the fundraising of Rotary. So this is, of course, El Salvador, one of those countries who have guerrillas all the time, almost throughout the century. So even the rebels participated in the program by stopping their war and helping out polio vaccination drive, just to show that the mass polio vaccination drive has caught the imagination of the people, including rebels, including extremists who would stop there. Even Afghanistan, we have seen this, unfortunately, not now. Previously in Afghanistan and Pakistan, even militants have uh, helped in the polio vaccine, at least by stopping their war and declaring a ceasefire. This is the last, he's the last known case of polio in uh, in the Americas, Luis Fermin Teneiro, Peruvian boy, 1991. So even though he had to sort of resign from many of the structures he created, he had the satisfaction of living long enough to see the World Health Assembly endorse in 1988, the global eradication goal. So this was much later, almost five years after Rotary and Sabin declared it has to be eradicated. And even that owed much to the success of elimination program in the America. So it was only the American success that led on to the global eradication drive. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Santosh, uh, for the very informative and well-researched session. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions online. Um, so can we take the questions now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So the first question is, uh, what are the three types, one, two, and three, uh, are each tailored to a particular polio strain? Yeah, yeah of course. The, the polio virus, there are three strains of the polio virus, type one, two, and three. And the vaccine which we use uh, contains all the three, especially the injectable polio vaccine. So right now, type two is eradicated worldwide. At least the wild type of type two is eradicated. So we're using more bivalent oral polio vaccine, but the injectable polio vaccine contains all the three viruses. Viruses. 
the killed virus okay now the other question is uh, long term circulation will lead to uh, increased possibility of new variants and mutation is it right exactly yeah so polio virus as any other rna virus our familiar friend covid is uh, i mean i think dr vinod can answer is better but uh, anyway there is a certain rate of mutation in the polio vac- vaccine virus also because we're seeing a live virus this is unlike the uh, disease virus covid virus is mutating but covid vaccine won't do because it is not a live virus but we are using in polio a live virus it can mutate but fortunately the rate is very very low but when it happens what happens is there is a unfettered circulation within a community so if you actually um, partially immunize a community uh, the virus the vaccine can circulate among the unvaccinated children so every always remember that unvaccinated children unvaccinated communities or uh, will give rise to a variation in the vaccine structure it can result in neurovirulence it is well known it is called vaccine derived polio virus you can google it you can find out so currently the world is facing a challenge from vaccine derived polio virus so we having lot of vdpv outbreaks and there is nothing to differentiate a wild virus outbreak from a vdpv outbreak children are paralyzed all the same now how who is trying to deal with this we are trying to keep the vaccination levels very high so that this question doesn't arise but it is a tiger by the tail the moment it drops vdpv occurs and again vdpv spreads so for that there is a new vaccine now in the horizon is already implemented in fact called nopv or novel oral polio vaccine which apparently will be more stable than the current opv the current opv's problem is it is less stable so that it can undergo some changes the vaccine itself not the virus virus changes that's another story so this new no, novel oral opv apparently is resistant a little bit more stable than the original oral polio vaccine and hopefully this can be used to contain the vdp outbreaks thank you uh, now uh, there's one more question on how does opv compare with ipv apart from the ease of administration through the oral route in terms of effectiveness in this polio are they comparable yeah the, the the story of the polio vaccine is very interesting because in the developed countries even three doses or four doses of oral polio vaccine was sufficient to produce enough antibodies to stop not only infection of the child but also outbreaks but unfortunately when it came to india our the tropical countries we found that this three four doses is not enough and we used to have situations as seven eight nine doses are required for full protection that is the story of opv ipv on the other hand it doesn't vary with uh, much with population so if you give three doses it gives reasonably good protection up to 90 97% is the protection the only difference being in opv there is local protection and mucosal protection in ipv it is not there it is there but limited so ipv does give us some amount of mucosal protection but opv gives mucosal protection therefore it's more useful in outbreaks so that it can it can stop an outbreak uh, much faster than an ipv because ipv prevents individual infection it won't prevent much of transmission of the virus yeah so thank you very much uh, and for uh, the audience who are uh, a lot of public who are also about concerned about the vdpv outbreaks that are happening now across the world the recent one i believe from israel uh, could you elaborate a bit more on vdpv and what they are and how can we sort of take care of it you you mentioned it uh, in brief yeah. but could you explain it a bit yeah before? so to again say the oral polio vaccine um, if it is being given let's say there are 100 children in a community we give the vaccine to 100 children it is fine nothing is going to happen if you give it to 40 children and leave it at that what happens is when the vaccine escapes from a vaccinated child to an unvaccinated child one child is fine then it continues the chain so from one unimmunized child it goes to another unimmunized child so it's like passing the virus through series of human intestines what something what we do in vaccine production also only thing this time it's in the reverse so when it passes through a chain of unimmunized children's bowels it gradually at one point the mutation becomes sufficient to cause problems for the body neurovirulence so that is also then it starts behaving just like a wild virus so it always happens when instead of immunizing 80 or 90 children in a 100 children community we give it to 40 50 and leave it at that then it will escape from the vaccinated child to the unvaccinated child it circulates in the unvaccinated community without any hindrance that is when the mutation starts so what is the uh, what is the preventive stuff for preventing this is 
saturation vaccination coverage so if you give it to 90 95% this problem will not arise the problem has always arisen in communities where the vaccination coverage has gone down from 100 to 60 65 55 that is when it has happened the, the, the next is reason why it is happening as i said because the vaccine virus is unstable little bit unstable in fact i remember dr jacob john saying that very unstable virus is a vaccine but it is a virus so it's a live virus so being unstable rna virus it can undergo changes the only saving grace was that if you give it saturation coverage it may not do so so because it is not always possible to give saturation coverage you have war like situations in afghanistan and pakistan that is why who went in and developed a vaccine which is more stable and will not mutate that is a novel oral polio virus uh, oral polio vaccine yeah one this one more question and this from professor geeta govindraj uh, really interesting talk when do you see the uh, or when do you foresee the stopping of opv in india yeah that's a that's a million dollar question <laughs> so the current uh, strategic plans are that uh, uh, now we don't have at least in india we are not talking about the world now so we don't have the virus for the last so many years so it's in 11 uh, and of course we don't even have edpv so we don't have edpv either so the hope is that um, after the mass vaccination round which has now become one instead of uh, instead of two that will probably stop by 2024 25 it used to be like that now we are changing epidemiology because of all the viruses in our neighborhood and then once that stops then we can think of stopping oral polio vaccine altogether so it will take time and it will depend on epidemiology as it turns out so there is a document uh, which is available online about strategic uh, priorities but uh, my best guess is it is not going to happen too soon thank you very much uh, yeah, this is a very curious question from from my thought um, Uh, and uh, of course there is a lot of literature on this and you could elaborate more uh, a subset of individuals with primary immunodeficiency can yes, yes. right uh, could you elaborate on on that yeah so i think you are the best person to talk about that but anyway so one of the things which again uh, um, when we talk about vdpv when i didn't elaborate so we have three types of vdpv we have um, um, one of the types is immunodeficiency vdpv which is which arises from primary immunodeficient people so instead of the virus circulating among 100 unvaccinated children uninterrupted for a period of time the vaccine va- circulates within the person because that person is uh, uh, is having an immunodeficiency so it, it circulates within the person and in that process takes one year so one year is a time period in which you start to get a, a, a 10% change in nucleotide so instead of getting one year in the community it gets one year in the person and then it mutates so ivdpv is one of the in fact we had a i think the first well studied ivdpv case at least as far as i remember of some bellor this is a child with a family with primary immunodeficiency and i remember presenting this to the medical college in madurai so they had a, they had a vdpv case and this was an ivdpv so uh, the problem with the, again that is one of the uh, one of the challenges for stopping opv is that only even if we stop opv there will be this subset of individuals maybe there are 10 20 30 who will be secreting the opv vaccine so are we safe in stopping it uh, when these people are around so i think uh, that is the importance of the project dr vinod and uh, uh, dr geeta is doing that uh, imch is doing is that we are trying to find out how long is going to happen and what will be the behavior uh, once we stop opv altogether suppose suppose we have 100 people in the community exiting the virus regardless that will be a problem i think more information will come from us study uh, regarding the longevity and all that so i think that's all the questions thank you very much uh, dr santosh for the very very informative very well thank researched you. topic uh, thank you very much uh, you. and before we close uh, we have our next session uh the next session would be on 24th of april and this would be handled by dr uh, chantani r professor from the government medical college in calicut where she would discuss the experiences and learnings from the nipa virus outbreak in kerala uh thank you very much uh, uh thank you for all for listening in have a good evening thank you